Glory to God. Amen. God bless you all. May be seated. Sunday school kids can go downstairs. I don't know what I did to my life, but apparently I broke it. Thank you, Jesus. God bless all of you for being here this morning. Appreciate you coming out to worship the Lord and share your testimonies and prayer requests. Praise the Lord. I do want to just uh, emphasize what uh, Sheila has already said, and that is please, if you can stay and eat, do so. If you can't, please take something with you. And if you didn't bring a container, we'll dig up something. We've got some stuff downstairs, so please take some with you. And We don't, we don't want to see it wasted and uh, thrown in the trash for nothing. And I was talking to Tim before church. You know, it's the way things are set up now, you can't just take it to a, a shelter or something and give it to them because once it's you know, out of the bag, it's, it's not, they can't receive it anymore. So there's nothing wrong with it. Obviously, it's good stuff. It'll all be good, but uh, just we don't want to throw it away when there's so many people going hungry. I know my parents used to say that. Well, there's people in China starving. I'm thinking, well, send them my broccoli then, you know. But, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Uh, it's just a shame to have to throw away when there's so many people that are hurting and, and doing without. So <coughs> praise the Lord. Thank you, Mike. All right, God bless you again. And uh, I just uh, I discovered something. I was, I was at a gas station the other day. A couple of weird things happened, but one of them was I told a guy. I said, "You know what? I could I could make you a fortune." Because yeah, they were selling, you know, they sell oil and antifreeze and all this stuff. And I said, "Do you know how to make antifreeze?" And he said, "No." And I said, "Well, steal her blanket." <coughs> antifreeze. Antifreeze. <laughs> antifreeze. How do you make antifreeze? Yeah, you steal her blanket. Praise the Lord. You wishing now I hadn't repeated it? Is that what you're saying? Praise the Lord. Well, the other day, uh, this, the other thing that happened there was uh, two gals were standing there. I was telling Sally about this yesterday. And they were, I was waiting to check out, and the gal that was doing the checking out was talking to a woman who was taking her groceries through, and she said, they were talking about makeup, some new makeup they were using, and she just went on and on about, oh man, this stuff is really great. It just works miracles, you know, it makes you look so much younger, and blah, 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 and on and on they went, and I stood there waiting and waiting, and finally the gal leaves, and so the checkout lady was a little bit embarrassed because of the whole process, and as long as I had to stand there, and she said, well, how do I look? And I said, well, you look like you painted your eyebrows too high, and she looked surprised. <laughs> Sally had the same uh, reaction, praise the Lord. <laughs> Dear heavens. The worse they are, the better they are. That's, you've got to get on the same wavelength here. You know what's the worst thing about ancient orators? They just babble on. I'm trying to go fast here to get the pain over with as quickly as possible. I hate insect puns, though, because they really bug me. All right, here's a moment of seriousness. Do you know why Swedish warships have barcodes on them? This is interesting. So that when they dock, they can Scandinavian. <laughs> that was a good one. I thought that was a good one. Praise the Lord. Scandinavian. All right, praise the Lord. I should be embarrassed, but see, that just tells you how disconnected I am from reality, praise the Lord. All right, let's, get, let's go to the Word of God. I want to start, uh, Suzanne, with Galatians 4 and verses 1 through 7. I, uh, sometimes I just don't know how this stuff is supposed to go together. I mean, I feel like the Lord is talking to me, and then I'm trying to hear the way he's saying it, and uh, so hopefully that's what I've accomplished. I don't know. I'm trusting the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Yes, so now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, 
made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now I want you to remember this because we read this stuff sometimes and we don't realize who's being spoken to, the context in which it's being spoken. So to redeem them that were under the law, now here's the thing, comma, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you're sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Praise the Lord. Now, so here's the deal. Christ was made under the law, right? In Galatians 3.13, it says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Amen? Now, this isn't referring to Gentiles or to us, non-Jews, because the Gentiles were never under the law. Amen? And they could not, therefore, be under the curse of the law. If they were never under the law, they couldn't be cursed by that law, right? So then let's look at this quickly in Galatians 3.14. that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So that we here is referring to both the Jews and the Gentiles, that they might both receive the promise of inheriting the whole world. And I'll show you that here in Romans 4.13. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. His seed were the Jewish people, right? Well, actually, it's everybody that's of faith. But uh, genealogically, it was, it was the Jewish people. So God gave Moses. Now, here's the deal. God gave Moses the law three different times. First time was in Exodus 20, uh, verses 1 through 17. Then he did it again in Exodus 31, verse 18. And then again in Exodus 34, and I believe it's verse 1. But the deal is not one Gentile was present to receive the law. So then the Gentiles couldn't be subjected to the curse of the law that they were never under. All right? So the Gentiles were without God. According to Ephesians 2.12, it says the Gentiles were without God and without hope in the world. Why? Because they were outside of the covenant of Abraham. Amen? They were alienated, the Scripture says, from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from covenants of promise. Let's just look at it. Ephesians 2.12, just so you know. Okay. At that, at that time, they were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. So they lived under the curse, but not the curse of the law. They lived under the curse that went all the way back to Genesis 3.16, which was Adam and Eve, their uh, rebellion. Amen. That's the curse we were under. Amen. So the importance, you say, okay, so what's, what's the big deal about that? What's the importance of this? It's thinking that we, Gentiles, have been redeemed from the curse of the law. It's important because you can see the influence that the infiltration of the law has had on our lives. Praise the Lord. The Judaizers of the past, and I'll say today, have succeeded in deceiving the people of God into a law-ruled mentality. Praise the Lord. And so they remove us from the grace-ruled mentality. Because subconsciously, we're thinking rules, regulations. We're thinking the law. We've been redeemed from the law. We weren't redeemed from the law. We were never under the, the law. Amen. We were redeemed from the curse that Adam brought on the human race by his rebellion and rejection of God's truth. Amen. All right. So Galatians 1.6 Now stay with me because I'm, I'm trying to make some sense out of this to me first. Praise the Lord. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel or unto another teaching. Amen. So Satan has a plan. And he's had the plan ever since he found out what God's deal was, you know. And that was that he was going to teach the law through people either ignorantly 
or willingly. And here in 1 Timothy 1.7, it, ta it talks about that very thing. Satan has a plan, and he wanted to teach us things via the law to keep us law-minded. Amen? So desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. We've got people all over the world teaching the law, and they don't even know what they're talking about. And their prop, Timothy's prophet, it was happening then, but he was prophesying this is going to be the problem in the future. The same thing I'm dealing with right now, he said, you know. And we know Paul talked about it because there was struggles all the time between the Judaizers, people, Jews that had been born again that were still trying to mix the law in there with, with their salvation. Amen. Look in Galatians chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. So there's, there's the ignorance. Ignor people ignorantly preaching the law. And then there's those who know that it's not the truth, but they're going to preach it anyway. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. So we're talking circumcision here, but it's just a, it's just a ritual. It's just a rite. And it, it, it could be any of the r religious rules and regulations that are being taught as though those are the things that can save you today. Right? So Satan has this plan, and it's, it's to manipulate the Word of God and the, and the ministry into bringing people back under the law or giving them a, a law kind of thinking. Amen? And that plan is to rob us. The reason he does it is because that robs us of our inheritance. Our inheritance is every promise in the Word of God. So a lot of the times, the devil comes to steal. I mean, that's, what, that's his motive. And he's... He's good at lying and deceiving and, and manipulating, even the Word of God. And so, look at Romans 4 and verse 14. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. So if the inheritance, the promises of God, are received by keeping the law then faith has no value whatsoever. And God told Abraham, it's your faith that has made you righteous. By your faith I have declared you to be righteous. Amen? So, praise God. Thank the Lord. Look at, let's, look, let's look at Galatians 3.18 here. Praise God. So the devil has this plan, and it's, it's to manipulate us or to, to confuse us or to cause us to be rule or law-minded so that we cannot receive the promises of God. Because you don't get the promises of God anyway except by faith. And Jesus talked about it, or Paul talked about it. He said, if Jesus and Paul both, if you, you think, okay, well, so, you know, I get it, but I'm going to keep the law and, and live by grace. You can't. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. He said that it's like you take a little drop of yeast and put it in uh, some flour. It's all now got leaven in it. You can't, how are you going to get it out of there? You know, I mean, once it's in, it becomes a part of that. So, for if the inheritance be of the law, it's no more a promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. All right? So, and an even more uh, specific result is we've been trying to earn by our works, doing the works of the law, what we should have received freely by grace. He said the works of the law are dead works. In other words, they're worthless. They don't accomplish it. They don't get you anything. Amen? Instead of trusting God having done the work, we're still trying to do work, and that eliminates the ability of God to give us the finished work. Am I making any sense? Praise the Lord. All right. So without going into all of it, let's look at Galatians chapter 4 and verse 5 here. And I don't know if anybody else ever got confused by any of this, but sometimes it kind of caused me to rethink things. But he said, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now here's the deal. Uh, that Greek word adoption doesn't mean what it means today in our Western way of speaking or thinking. 
Today, adoption means I'm going to pick this child out from outside of the family, and I'm going to make him or her a son or a daughter, you know, by adopting them, right? So, in the New Testament, or under the, the way it was written uh, in the New Testament, adoption actually refers to the ritual of, how many of you have heard of a bar mitzvah? Okay, now we're talking Greek language here, but it's the same thing. And the idea is the adoption refers to the ritual of parents adopting their own children into their family. Now, here's what I'm saying. The, word, the Greek word is uh, huiotheisia, and it's in, in Strong's Concordance, it's number 5206, so you can look it up later. It's a compound word that literally means son placing, or in the sense of adult son placing. Okay? It's referred to the ceremony where a minor son was formally initiated into full family status by being given the rights and privileges of an adult. Today I am a man. That's what they would say in the bar mitzvah, and they have the same for, for the girls. So the Greek word adoption didn't mean to take a child outside the family and bring them in, but it symbolized the imparting of the full rights of sonship on a minor child who was already a member of that family. In other words, giving them their adult inheritance, even though they were still a child. Now, we know he said about the Jews, they were under tutors and governors because they were children and couldn't get the inheritance until they were adults or until they were mature. This is telling us this is what God did for us. Amen? So, and here's, here's where the kind of the confusion comes in. Look at Galatians chapter 4 and 5. Excuse me, yeah, chapter 4, verse 5. To redeem them that were under the law, who were under the law, the Jews, right? To redeem them that were under the law, that we, that's us, that not the Jews, right? So he says, first of all, this was to redeem them that were under the law, that we, that were not under the law, might receive the adoption of sons. Now here's where it gets kind of weird. That explains why we are both born of God, born again, of God, from above, right? And adopted by God. Are you with me? Praise the Lord. Okay, look at Galatians 4, 6, and 7, the next two verses. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. The Bible talks about us being adopted, but what he's talking about is treating us as though we were mature, as though we were full grown. In other words, he's saying, you have a right to the inheritance. Praise the Lord. It had nothing to do with the law. It had to do with you being born again by faith, and then he adopts you. You're already in the family, but you're just that little minor child. But then he adopts you and gives you the privileges of being a full-grown uh, heir. Right? So like a 12-year-old can't get the inheritance. Got to wait till he's 21 or whatever it might be. That's what he's talking about. You have an inheritance, and I'm going to give you the status of a full-grown adult so that you can have the inheritance, so you can experience the inheritance. You can have it. Amen? So it's referring to the ceremony where this minor son is formally initiated into the family. Praise God. All right, the child under tutors and governors then is the Jew that was under the law. The son adopted into the family that he's already born into through the new birth is both Jew and Gentiles. Right? Then we end up with the same status. Right? So through this adoption, we've received the promised inheritance by grace on the grounds of whose children we are, not based on what we do or don't do. It was the same for the Jews. The only trouble was the Jews had so much tradition in their religion, they couldn't let go of it. And in fact, they wanted to pass it on to the Gentiles, and it, would have, it, it flips everything backwards. It's, it's the opposite of what God really wanted to do. Did I make any sense of that? Praise the Lord. You're looking funny at me. Hallelujah. Maybe it's the glasses. Praise God. It's not based on religious grounds of what we can do or what we can earn from God, but it's based on our position in Christ, who we are. It has nothing to do with the law. It has never had anything to do with the law as far as Gentiles were concerned. 
And for a Jew to be born again, the law has absolutely nothing to do with it either because they have to be born again. Praise the Lord. All right, look at, so uh, Matthew 15, verses 1 to 6. And I'm trying to explain why it is it seems like we struggle so much with our inheritance or with the promises of God. And it's, a lot of it is because we still have this subliminal kind of way of thinking about things that is that I'm not measuring up. You know, I'm not doing enough for God to bless me or to, to be good to me. You know, he, he, it doesn't work that way. He isn't blessing us because of how good we are. Now, the more you get blessed and the more you see the love of God and the more you understand the relationship that you have with God... Some of that junk ought to just fall away because it's not the motivator that you had, you know, before when you were sh shooting up and getting high and getting drunk all the time or whatever it might be. It's because we feel insecure because we don't have uh, the relationship that will fulfill us. We don't understand that. So we think that if I just go and be really good, then then God will bless me. Well, he doesn't bless you because you're good. He blesses you because you're part of the family. You're in relationship. And if you're in the family and you have this relationship and you have the security of that relationship, you won't need to do a lot of the things that you feel like you need to do now to give you some peace or to give you some comfort or whatever it might be. Praise the Lord. And you say, okay, well, I don't drink. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to go down the list, but you're doing something. I know, I'm like Santa. I know who's naughty and nice. Everybody's naughty. We're all human beings, right? There's, there's no good. I mean, we can be better people. I mean, we can be kinder. We can be nicer. We can be more moral. But that doesn't give us any points with God. That just helps us with our, you know, lateral kind of relationships. That has nothing to do with the relationship I have with him. He's going to love me no matter what. He's like a good, the best dad, right? You can be a complete loser, a jerk, and he's still going to love you, Right? And he's going to hope that through him loving you and accepting you, you'll grow out of this other stuff. Yeah. You'll, you'll, get, you'll mature, right? So then came uh, to Jesus, scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? Because they don't wash their hands when they eat bread. And he answered and said unto them, Why do you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But you say... Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it's a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your traditions. That is the characteristic of a lot of churches today. In fact, I would say most churches. As by their tradition, men have made void and ineffective the word of God. So they had, a, they had a law, a commandment that told them to honor their parents, to support their parents financially and whatever they had to do when they were old. Somebody had, they didn't have welfare. They didn't have, uh, you know, Social Security and that stuff. The family had to take care of them. That was their responsibility. And they're saying, yeah, but, you know, here's the deal. We believe that if we just say, be blessed, pat them on the head, say, thanks, Dad, and do nothing for them, our tradition tells us that we've fulfilled our responsibility. And he's saying, no, you're just manipulating the word so it will fit what you want to do rather than what God intended you to do. So the word tradition speaks of Antichrist. Hallelujah. And how about the Antichrist was in, you know, they're talking about the spirit of Antichrist. Paul said it's here now. There are many spirits of Antichrist and they're among us even now. This was 2,000 years ago. Believe me, he's still here. That spirit is still involved. And it's still involved where it has always been involved in the church. Praise the Lord. So it speaks of this Antichrist. It's something that people use as a substitute for a real relationship with God. Praise the Lord. And look, there's loads of people who religiously go to church every Sunday out of tradition. Never having a real relationship with God. I mean, you could just... Y'all have been in those churches. I mean, I, I have. I was part of it, you know. And so thinking that just if I'm disciplined myself and I go, and I'm not saying don't come to church. You, sh you should go to church, but for the right reason, to celebrate your relationship with God and your fellow believers, your brothers and sisters in the Lord, right? So tradition substitutes for the things of God, 
and it never requires a relationship with God. And we all know, we've, we know this. I mean, there's churches that are filled with people who are very religious. And I mean, they could do all the rituals. They'll, they'll do everything they're commanded to do by, the, by that tr church, the tradition of that church. And no, they have no concept of a relationship with God whatsoever. They're letting the preacher or somebody else be the conduit. They're kind of like the, the children of Israel were with Moses when they said, you talk to him, he freaks us out. And then you tell us what he said. And the good thing about that is, then they can say, which they did, who are you to talk to us that way? You're just, you're just another man. I mean, you could, you're going to tell me God wants me to do this? How do I know it's God? You know, they put him in the position to do that, and then they told him, you're a jerk, you're a hypocrite, you're going to tell us to do stuff and, and claim that God told you that that's what we're supposed to do. He's just doing what they ask him to do, right? Anyway, this whole idea of substituting the things of God or the relationship with God for uh, their own purposes is exactly what the Pharisees were doing in the book of Matthew. They were transgressing the commandment of God by following a tradition instead of what the Word of God said. I'm telling you, this is, that's religion. Bah, that's what it is. It's just it's traditional effort based on some ritual or some rite or some uh, teaching of a denomination or just a religion. So they were transgressing the Word of God. And how were they transgressing it? By their religion. Praise the Lord. It happens all the time. You guys mad at me today or what's the deal? Because I can get really jerky here in a hurry. But <laughs> I mean, I was when I came in. I just kind of don't act like it when I'm up here. But. Anyway, week after week, they, we follow traditions and they are completely void of the life of God. Regardless of what our traditions are, what's important is God's Word working in our life. Amen? 2 Timothy 3.16 said, every, every Word of God is profitable. Right? For uh, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That's what the scriptures are there for. Amen? Every scripture is the word of God. Every scripture is God-breathed. It's dealing with our religious traditions. Man's opinion. Amen? A carnal or, or a natural way of relating to life and God. 2 Corinthians 10, uh, verses 3 through 5. The, I'm, the, the reason I'm saying this is, Without an, without an understanding of this, and I'm not saying this is, you know, the, the complete understanding of it by any means, but I'm saying without an understanding of this, we're going to live our lives disconnected and wonder then why isn't my life blessed? Why do I have this financial issue? Why do I have this relational issue? Why do I have this, you know, health thing or whatever it might be? And it's because we think there's still something left for us to do in order for me to get that. And he's saying, you've, if you're born again, Jew or Gentile, you are the family of God. You are a child of God and an heir to everything that God has. A joint heir with Jesus. Amen? And because we know that intellectually, but I don't know that we actually live out that reality. Because subconsciously, like I said, or subliminally, we're thinking, man, that wasn't, I, I didn't have a good day today. You know, I got upset. I flipped somebody off in the traffic, or I cussed, or I did this, or I, whatever it might have been, right? Not that I do that. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about other people that I know or I'm aware of that behave that way. Praise the Lord. Amen. Corner right there. Praise the Lord. Got those high eyebrows, right? She looks surprised. But I can just say it. <laughs> For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing, that what you could say is traditions, it's religion, right? Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So bringing everything into the captivity or submission to the word of God. So if you've got a tradition, you better find it in here. 
Because it has to submit to what God has said. It's not superior to the Word of God. And we've got churches everywhere that have traditions that you can't find in here. Not without a lot of manipulating of the Word. Amen? So bringing everything into the captivity or submission to the Word of God. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty. Yes. How do we war? How do we war? We war through the one whose name is called the Word of God. These situations we're talking about this morning with these deaths and, and the gangs and so on and so forth, you're not going to beat them by standing on a street corner with an Uzi, you know, or a 9 millimeter or something, and just try to kill as many as you can before they kill you. That ain't going to work. The way we're going to overcome them is by the Word of God. Because that's the only weapon that is powerful enough to deal with the spirit that is behind this stuff. Because it's not these young men or women, it's a spirit that they have yielded themselves to or submitted to. And that's what we have to come against it. Uh, I mean, obviously, we know if, if the law could do something, it would have done something. And we say, oh, blame it on the guns. Give me a break. Guns don't do anything to, but what the person holding it does. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying, I'm saying young people shouldn't have guns probably. Because they're not mature enough to know when and when not to use it. I carry one. I've got a, a 9 millimeter in my briefcase. You think a preacher? My God. Well, they kill preacher as quick as they will a cab driver, you know. I mean, so it's not because I'm out there looking for somebody to shoot. It's out there in case somebody wants to shoot me. I have some defense or my wife or my children or whoever might be with me at the time, right? So I'm not looking to use it. I've had opportunity where I've been really upset. In fact, I told you about this a couple months ago. Guy pulls out in front of me, tries to run me off the road. I mean, he, he, I don't know, he was high or what he was. He was all messed up. And I honked. And, he, of course, he flips me off, and, and I, it just so happens. I wasn't following him. I wanted to, but I'm thinking, don't forget, you're not a young guy here. You know? you're, not, you're not going to scare him you know, with your physique or anything. It turns out, though, I pull into High V's gas station, and the clown is right in front of me. I lost him in the traffic coming from up by Walmart in that area. And when I tur he turned in there before me, but I wasn't paying any attention anymore. I'd already just wrote it off as just some clown out here acting like an idiot. You know, I pull in, and he's in the pump right in front of me. So I get out, and I'm going to walk over there and say something to him. I wasn't going to be mean. I was just going to say, hey, man, you know, the reason I honked was you pulled into my lane without warning, you know, coming off from uh, around a curve. And uh, before I could say anything, he started cussing me and ranting and raving, and a lot of good stuff was re repeated. And there's other people there pumping their gas. It's a woman, you know, on the other side over here, and he's just, I mean, he's using language I haven't used since I was in the Marine Corps. And, <laughs> praise the Lord, I mean, not out loud. And I just told him, he's a, I said, you're a jerk. Sorry, you know, I'm, I, I just wanted to explain to you what happened. I said, I had the right of way. You were in the wrong lane. You nearly ran into me. You're an idiot. Of course, he didn't come to attack me or anything, but he, I'm just saying it could have very easily digressed into a physical confrontation. If he'd have had a weapon, I'd have had to use mine. Now, everything in me wanted to go over there and just B-slap him, you know? <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, that's what was it. I'm a Christian. I'm a pastor, but that's what was in me. That was what, what I was thinking at the time. This clown needs a lesson. And this old man just could, might be the one to teach it to him, you know? Or surely I would have got a lot of sympathy from the people around there thinking, what, that old man, he's going to be hurt, you know? But I'm just saying, it's in all of us to react crazy in heated situations. That's where you have to have some maturity because otherwise what happens when you get mad and you happen to have a weapon, you're liable to pull the trigger before you think anything about what the consequences are going to be. That what's this going to mean to my wife? What's this going to mean to the kids, the grandkids? The, you know, what's this going to mean to me? At my age, going to prison, any sentence is going to be life. You know, I mean, if it's more than six months, you know what I mean? So I'm just saying, we look at these young people and see what they're doing. It, is, it isn't the guns. It's the lack of maturity and the lack of understanding and the lack of respect for one another, uh, for humanity in itself, that's, that causes the problem. And that is a spirit. That isn't... You know, I mean, that, that isn't just, it doesn't just happen, right? It's a spirit. And we have to be wise enough then to not confront that or to battle that 
the same way they're doing their thing. We need to come from a higher position. We need to come from the Spirit. Because that's the thing that will not only disarm them, but make them not want to use those things for the wrong reason. There's a reason for us in the United States to have the right to bear arms. We came from a nation where the government controlled everything and, you know, manipulated and threw people in prison and, and uh, come in and take them out of their homes and do whatever they wanted to do. That's what our founding fathers were familiar with. And they said, it ain't going to happen here. Because if the government turns on us, we're going to have some way that we can try to defend ourselves against them. Right? So it's a right. It's a, it's a privilege in the United States, but it's a right. So you're not going to do away with that. What you need to do away with is the stupidity of the people who have those guns. I don't mean to get into this political thing, but I'm, just, I'm trying to make the, you know, the correlation here between the spirit and the flesh, right? So though we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So tradition is idolatry. Amen? It's putting something high on a higher level than God. Thank you, Jesus. I, uh, Acts chapter 15, verses 5 through 20. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, these are, these are Christians. They're Jewish converts. the Messianic Jews, in other words. And they're saying that they rose up the sect of the Pharisees which believed. So they believed in Jesus. They were born again. But they still had these traditions. And they said it was needful to circumcise these Gentiles that were being born again and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So they didn't... This is a struggle that was going on in the very earliest stages of Christianity. And Paul talks about it repeatedly, and Jesus talked about it all the time because he was setting them up for what was coming, the, the end of the, the law and the dispensation of grace that would come after his resurrection. So the apostles and the elders came together for, to consider this matter. Amen? And when there had been such much disputing, they'd been arguing about this, who's right, who's wrong, and they said to them, and by the way, that's why we have 50,000 denominations. Because every time somebody gets a revelation, instead of incorporating it into the body of Christ, they run off and start another church somewhere because nobody else will embrace it, right? They used to say, a church I went to as a uh, young man, relatively young, they'd say, uh, <laughs> praise the Lord. Uh, uh, bear with me. It's, it's in here. I'm, I'm rolling it back. Praise God. The, this is awkward, but I've got to remember it now. Help me. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll come back. If it comes back, I'll tell you. Uh, but when, when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto the men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did us. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? So they're trying to get, make them do something they couldn't even do, right? But we believe that though the grace, through the grace of God, the Lord Jesus Christ will, shall be, through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved, even as they. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave an audience to Barnabas and Saul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this I will return and will rebuild or build again the tabernacle of David which has fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up. That the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called saith the Lord who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God 
but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. So fornication is operating outside of the covenant that you are in, or outside of the relationship that you have with God. So there's a lot of fornicating going on. Amen. In the world, I just like to use that word. It's so bizarre. But there's a lot of fornicating going on. I'm not talking about, uh, you know, sexual stuff here. I'm talking about what fornication is defined as in the Word of God, and it's operating outside of your covenant, your relationship with God. So you, it, you'd be hard-pressed to find a church that isn't in fornication, b based on that defi definition. Amen? 2 Corinthians 11, verses 2 and 3. I know you're still struggling with what was it he was going to say. And see, I, you know, I had memory lapses ever since I was 19. You know, Short-term memory loss, right? You know what I mean? So this is, you know, you can say, well, you know, he's getting senile, he's old now. And no, no, this is, this is a way of life for me. Don't, don't read anything too much into it. Yeah, okay. For I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Someone who hasn't been involved in fornication. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. That's exactly what I'm talking about here today. Amen. We have been espoused to one husband. And that husband is Jesus Christ. And who is Jesus Christ? The Word made flesh. Amen? All right? So if we operate outside of that covenant relationship, outside of the Word of God, you know, as it is written, not as we interpret it, amen, outside of that relationship with the Lord, we are committing fornication, and we then are adulterers. That's why Jesus said, you know, we, in the denomination I was in, they used to say, uh, Christ, you know, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. How many of you want to go back to that real quick? Praise the Lord. I'd like to every once in a while just submit. God, bless God. But really, I don't want that because it's, that, isn't what, that isn't the way it works. That isn't the way. You know, God isn't treating us that way. He, he's telling us in that scripture uh, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, right? He's talking about this is how Jesus relates to us. He loves it. He's not looking for submission. He's looking for love. He's looking for acceptance. He's looking for respect. Amen? And that's the way we're supposed to treat one another. That's the way we have our relationship, amen, with the Lord. So, praise the Lord. Look at, let's, let's look at this, uh, Hebrews 12, verses 16 and 17. Remember we talked a few weeks back, this covenant that we have right now is the dispensation of grace. That's the covenant that we are under with God. You can't work outside of that covenant. In other words, you can't go back to the law because God's not working in that anymore. He's in the dispensation of grace, which is where we are and have been ever since the resurrection of Jesus. So now, if you're not saved, if you're not born again, you're going to be held to the law, right? Because you have, the, the only way you're in this dispensation is if you're born again. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to be judged by the law. The reason we're not judged by the law is Jesus has already been judged by the law, and he fulfilled it perfectly, and yet he was crucified. Why? Not because of anything he did, because he did everything perfect. He's Crucified because of us and our inability to keep the law. And our inability to do anything about the curse that was on Adam and his progeny. You know, everybody that came after him are his descendants and were under the same curse. That's what we got redeemed from. Amen. So lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat, and you all know that story, right? He was the heir. He was the heir, heir apparent. He was the elder son, and he was supposed to get all of the inheritance. He sold all of that inheritance for a bowl of stoop. 
something to feed himself, some, a fleshly endeavor, right? So, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he was, would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, because he found no place of repentance, though he sought to carefully, though he sought it carefully with tears, and that word repentance is to turn it around, right? It's not like, oh, gee, I'm so sorry. No, it's about how can I get this thing turned back around like it's supposed to be. There wasn't any way for him to do it, right? So, anything that causes you to sell your birthright, and what's the birthright? It's our inheritance. It's the promises of God to give them up, to operate in a way that we, are, are, we can't access them, right? As acting as though we were not heirs. It's the best that God has for your life. That's what we're rejecting. His word concerning you. A spirit of fornication is what it is. And it will rob you and bring you into what the scripture calls tribulation. It's, a, it's carnality. Or it's a natural way of looking at your life and your circumstances. Saying this is, this is all there is. It's the way it's going to be. Not, not if you understand your inheritance and you get it. You take it. You grasp it. Amen. And there's only one way to do it. By faith. You believe you're the righteousness of God in Christ. You believe there's nothing more for you to do to get God's favor. He's already done it all. Now, people say, well, you know, I, I'm thinking about, you know, acts and, and behaviors, you know, that happen today. And sometimes, you know, if a person's a Christian or they're a believer, they're born again, and then they do something insane. You know, it happens. People shoot somebody or they'll, you know, you know, in the heat of a moment or just in stupid addictive behaviors and, and so on and so forth. And so we think, you know, come on. Uh, how can they be saved? Right? I mean, that's the natural way of looking at it. You say, Surely they're, they can't be saved and do that, can they? Of course they can. God knew everything you were ever going to do. And if you got saved when you were 10 years old, you might end up, uh, you know, at 25 or 30 Amen. With multiple, you know, broken relationships and drug addiction. and alcohol. I mean, who knows what it might turn into. But you're not surprising God. I mean, he didn't wake up that day. And go, oh, my God. Sally, what were you thinking? No, he knew it. He's not shocked by it. You know, he's not stunned by it. And people say, you know, I've heard, oh, oh, it grieves the heart of God. Look, quit this, you know, trying to equate God and us in the same way. He's not grieved. He was grieved at everything that Jesus took on him, and he still did it because it was the only way he could redeem us, the only way he could bring us back into relationship with him. And let's think about it. The price that he paid, this is God that came in human form and gave his life. God, the creator, the one who did it all. Why? Because he loved us. He wants a relationship with us. For God so loved the world. And then we come to this thing, and what do we do? Instead of, you know, instead of embracing the relationship or striving for a deeper relationship, we make it about a tradition or about a rule or a ritual. And it's no, I mean, is it any wonder then that we have this chaotic kind of junk going on in our lives when we don't realize the, the, the emphasis is supposed to be on the relationship, not on me, not on what I'm doing or not doing. It's supposed to be on my pursuit of God because he pursued me. Paul says it like this. He said, uh, I have been apprehended by that which I tried to apprehend. That's what happens. When you go to apprehend God, or when you go to seek deeper into God, God comes running. Praise the Lord. It's, it's, it's He that does it. He's just looking for our, the initial effort on our part to say, Man, I want more. I, I want to know you better. I want to understand this thing better. I'm tired of trying and failing and, you know, the repetitive cycle of ups and downs and ins and outs and feeling good one day and miserable the next and thinking, what a loss, what a failure, how am I going to make it? I mean, I've seen so many people over the years, especially in other denominations that we've been in, that love God. And you know they did. I mean, they, they, they love the Lord. But the pressure of trying to perform of trying to live up to some standard that God never applied in the first place causes people just to go, what the hell's the point? You know, I mean, I can't do this. I, I can't, I, I fail. I just keep failing. And nobody wants to live with that sense of failure 
over and over and over, and at some point you just go, okay, I'll just back away from this. Try something different. That's sad. Because those people are, are living out from a tradition instead of a relationship. If they understood the relationship, they'd do what Paul said. Yeah. I press toward the mark. Even though I'm far from it and I miss the mark all the time, I'm just going to get up and try it again. Because this isn't about me pleasing God. This is just about me having a better life. And how that can happen is through our relationship with Him. Amen? Praise the Lord. Galatians 5.19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. It doesn't really matter what they are. They're carnal things. They're natural things, right? So then look at Galatians 6, verses 12 through 18. You know, it doesn't take, uh, you know, an IQ of 300. You don't have to be a Mensa you know, to, uh, to understand the Word of God. But at the same time, you don't need to check your brain at the door when you're going to church because that's what happens. I mean, that's what happens so many times that we just quit thinking. You know, we just, we just figure, well, it must be true they said it, and that's a preacher, or that's a minister, or whatever, priest, or whatever it might be. And instead, of, we're doing like the children of Israel when it came to Moses. It's, it's too much work to try to figure this out. You, you figure it out and come tell me what he said. And now I'm stuck with this guy's problems, with his inhibitions, with his misinterpretations, and, right? That's why he says the Bereans were the best because, I'm not talking about the church over here, I'm talking about the Bereans. He said because they went and searched, they'd hear the word and then they'd go back and they'd search the scripture to see if it was true. Is this guy just blowing smoke or does he really know what he's talking about? So I, I mentioned this to Sally too the other day. The difference between the word and the world is one letter. Now what in that L do you want? Almost a pun. What in the L do you want? Right? It has nothing to offer us. Now I'm not saying everything there is bad. When I speak of the world, I just mean anything outside of Christ. Because he, he promised to give us the world. So I don't have to go trying to grope and grip and twist and manipulate and hurt people and take advantage of people to get everything that the world has for me. That's my inheritance. I'll show you. All right. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. Praise the Lord. Oh, glory to God. Galatians, is that, uh, let's go on to, uh, okay, God forbid I should glory, saving the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Now, what does Paul say? God forbid that I should glory, or I, I can't take any credit. No matter how good I am, how bad I am, I, I don't get any credit on either side, because except for the cross of Jesus Christ, that's the only place there's any glory, amen, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Praise the Lord. We are new creatures. We are a whole new species of humanity. We're God people, God men, born from above. As many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy upon the Israel of God. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Now, I'm sure Paul was catching crap because he told Timothy to drink wine for his stomach. He, you know, he, 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 was, doing, he was upsetting all the religious rules. He said, there are no laws. I'm free. The only law that there is is in my relationship with Jesus. And that's what he says. So I don't want to hear any more of your crap. That's what he's saying here. I'm sick of listening to your whining and pointing your finger at me and what a jerk I am. This guy was probably the greatest theologian to ever live. Amen. And these people are trying to tell him what he should be doing. And he's saying, you, he's the same who says, look, you're, you're trying to uh, te teach the Word of God and you don't even know it. 
You're telling people what to do, and the fact that what you're telling them to do is evident that you don't know. You're preaching the law, and the law is done with. It's over. The end of the age, the scripture is always talking about the end of the age, end of the age. Everybody freaks out and goes, oh, the end of the age. That means we're into Revelation and, you know, bugs the size of Volkswagens and all this other stuff going on. That's not what he's talking about. The end of the age was the age of the law or the dispensation of the law. That covenant was done with when Jesus died and was buried and rose again. It's done. It's fulfilled. It's finished. Unless you're not in Christ. And you still don't keep the law to get saved. The law is just there to show you, you can't keep it. I need a Savior. I need somebody else to do this for me. Praise the Lord. So, brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and your spirit. Amen? Hallelujah. As Jesus, he, he was espoused to us. Amen? And so because of that, we are to be pursuers of his life. And take the word of God just as he does. So here's, I mean, this is obvious, right? So you get married, and, or you're a spouse, which means you're going to be married uh, in, in uh, Jewish uh, thought. You were married. I mean, the moment you were a spouse, you were the same as married. The, 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 everything worked the same, right? And so what he's saying is, the moment you became married to Jesus, your attention isn't supposed to be on every other good looking thing that's roaming around out there, whatever it might be. You're supposed to be pursuing him, even though you're married. That's your pursuit. It's not neighbors, not bad. Praise the Lord, can't wait for summer. You see her out there working in the garden. I'm not confessing. I'm not admitting anything. I'm just saying. Right? We're supposed, our focus is supposed to be on that one. The one that I'm espoused to. That's all he's saying. I, it, how, anybody who's ever been in a relationship knows. I mean, this is like Tim was saying. I almost spoke it then. It's such a cliche, but it's so true. Love is blind, and marriage is an eye-opener. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, like Tim was talking about, you know, I, when you're dating... And you get married, and somehow things change a little bit. They're not exactly like they were in the, right? Your eyes were open, praise the Lord. Well, Jesus is saying, when your eyes open to this relationship, you're not ever going to be looking for anything else. Amen? This, this will be the thing that satisfies you 100% completely. You'll never look beyond it. There's no need to. And the more you look into the love of God and the goodness of God, the more attracted you are to it. Amen? It's, it's, that's how it's supposed to work. Praise the Lord. We're to be pursuers of His life and take the Word of God just the same as He does in agreement with Him, right? And that Word or that sword is going to make war with the traditions, with the carnality, amen, with the religion, because He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And guess what He calls us? Those that are with Him, they are the chosen and faithful. Amen. Praise the Lord. Galatians 6.15. I know I'm random and meandering all over the place here today. This has been a weird week for multiple reasons. But, I mean, nothing really secretive. You've all been going through the same kind of crap, but it's just been weird. It's just been hard to focus, you know what I mean? So many negatives and all that stuff. But, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncir uncircumcision, but the new creature. We just read that we are new creatures in Christ. We are the new creature. The rules don't mean sickum. They don't mean anything. Right? It's good moral compass, maybe, but they don't change your relationship with God one iota. God isn't looking at you through your obedience. He's looking at you through Jesus' obedience and declaring you then to be the righteousness of God because you are in Christ. Amen. So in Christ Jesus, people that are born again, the rituals don't mean anything. Whether you're doing them or whether you're not doing them, they have the same result. Nothing. All I'm interested in, are you a new creature or are you an old creature? If you're a new creature, you better become a new creature or you will be extinct. Praise the Lord. All right. So as we begin to know ourselves the way God knows us, 
as a new creature, right, without sin, praise the Lord, then He increases and we decrease. It's automatic. That's what John said. He must increase, or I must decrease that He may increase. In other words, this thing has got to submit to that thing. And I'm talking about the flesh. I'm not talking about who I am in the spirit. I'm perfect already. But I'm saying this thing that's looking around at all the crap that's happening and all the negative stuff and saying, oh, my God, what are we going to do? And I, I, I got, there must be something I can do to change. Yeah, you can believe what he has already said. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Ephesians 1 and 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Look at that. This is the Word of God. The Word of God who cannot lie. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So God has already done some things, right? He has blessed us. He has sanctified us or set us apart. Or as I said in the very beginning, He has adopted us into full-grown sons in his family. Full-grown sons and daughters. Ephesians 1, verses 20 and 21. If I don't do anything else, I'll give you so many questions, you have to go home and read the Bible <laughs> to see what that old fool was rambling about. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Remember the L word. When we believed in Jesus, we believed in his finished work. That's how you got born again. It's the finished work is what saves us, right? The death, burial, and resurrection. So we believe in the finished work. When we do that, or when we did that, we were placed in Christ. Amen. And that place is the heavenlies. Guess what's in the heavenlies? All the promises of God. Not being dominated by carnal or natural or religion or traditions. That's where we are seated. Far above all principalities, powers. He's not just talking about the devil. He's talking about human organizations and power and authority and religious domination. I mean, we know there are, I mean, we know instinctively there are some religions that are just evil. Right? And we, we, can, find, we can point them out and we'll, we'll be happy to do that. But we forget to look in the mirror and see that some of ours are just as evil, just as corrupt because of the traditions. Amen? Because of the rituals. When we believe in Jesus and in His finished work, we're placed in Christ. Here's the location of heavenly places. Far above principalities and powers and might and everything that is named, whether it's religion or traditions or whatever you want to throw out there, both in this world and in the world to come. The heavenly, in other words, is in Christ. When you got born again, you were seated. The scripture says we were seated with Him in heavenly places. Why? Because we're in Him. He can't go anywhere without us. And we can't go anywhere without Him. Praise the Lord. Everything that is named, both in this world and the world to come. Heavenly is in Christ, and so we have to operate from that position. From the knowledge of who we are in Christ. The new creature. Righteous. Perfect. James 1 20, no, don't, you don't have to go there for the sake of time. James 1.21, it talks about, and we've talked about it before, it talks about don't be a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word. Right? In other words, you can hear this, but unless you understand it enough to do it, confess it, speak it, right? It's not going to do you any good. You can hear it, but it's, it's living it out is what makes a difference. And the only way you can be a hearer and not a doer is to allow religion to, and tradition to define you instead of your relationship with God. Amen? Instead of defining yourself as being in Christ, already the righteousness of God, and, you know, and already seated in heavenly places. See, when I die, 
I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> well, that's self <laughs> right? I mean, that's obvious. You're not going anywhere except in the ground. No, I'm not going anywhere. I, me, who I really am, the Spirit, I'm not going anywhere. I'm already there. I'm already in heaven. I'm already in the heavenly, in Christ. Heaven isn't somewhere out past Mars. Heaven is just another dimension. We, we talk about, you know, up there and out there and all that kind of stuff, but that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about, I'm going to soar off into eternity somewhere. Eternity is wherever I am. I'm eternal. We're all eternal beings once we got born again. We'll just be in a different dimension. The, those that have gone before us, he talks about this great cloud of witnesses. Where are they? They're all around us. They're, they're not off 50 billion light years away on some weird planet in the sky in a cloud somewhere. No, they're right here. They're, they're witnessing. They're the great cloud of witness. It's egging us on and saying, look, we made it. You can do this. Just quit trying so hard and start trusting more. Praise the Lord. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 through 10. We're about done. Praise the Lord. See, we're supposed to be free. We're supposed to be the happiest, the most content, the most fulfilled, the most, I say happy, I mean I don't mean ha, 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 all the time, kind of ignorant. I just mean we should be at peace. We should feel good about life and all that's going on around us. Why? Because that's what God has given us. The very fact that we act like, just like the people in the world, something happens and we all flip. What's the difference between us and the guy down the street, right, who isn't born again and re reacts to situations and circumstances just like we do. And we're saying, come on, you need what I got. And he said, I already got what you got. Sorrow, suffering, pain, right? Bills. No, if I'm going to witness to this guy, if I'm going to convince this guy he needs what I got, I better have something more than what he's got. Right? I better have something that is tangible enough that I can say, look, man, I know it's crap. But there's a better way. There's a better life. There's a way that, that seems right to man. But the end of that is death. But there's a way that seems right to God, and the end of that is eternal life and blessings from God throughout that life. Yeah, tr in the world you're going to have tribulation because we're in the world. But be of good cheer. He's overcome the world, and I talked about it a week or so ago. Everything is under his feet, but that we observe not all things under his feet. What's he saying? He's saying he's, he's overcome everything, but if you don't believe he's over, overcome everything, then you've got some crap you're going to have to overcome. Because he's already done everything he's going to do. It's our perception. Mm -hmm. If I don't think it's done, then I'm looking for what I can do to get it done. But if I know that it's done, then I'm going to rest in that finished work. I'm going to re re realize that my faith is what's going to make this thing happen. Not my faith making it happen, but my faith allowing it to manifest in my life. Mm -hmm. Because he's already done it. This, that, that, this is the controversy. This is the contradiction. You know, this is the, the thing that causes us to struggle is we think it's about me being a more Christian person. The, the, the true Christian is somebody who's not worried about doing all this stuff. They're just enjoying the blessings of God and responding to that with love to God. No, they're not freaking out and acting weird and bizarre and, and messing everybody else's lives up. No, they're, they're saying, look, God's good. And he will do the same thing for you he's doing for me if you will believe. Make it about faith. Make it about the one thing that Jesus told us will work. And that's faith. Faith is just simply believing in him and what he has already done. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. The deceivableness of unrighteousness. And what is the difference between the righteous and the unrighteous? One saved and one isn't. That's, that's the only difference. There are unsaved people out here in the world that are better 
people than some of us. You know what I mean? That, that can flip you sometimes when you're around somebody who's really more really good, decent, honest person. And you see, sometimes I kind of cut some corners here, and, but they don't. But they're not even saved. And I am. That, what does that tell That tells you, oh, there must be, I'm doing something wrong. No. This is, this is not the criteria that God uses to measure us with. So you can see why when you talk this way, I know I'm rambling here, but just bear with me. You can see why people will do things once they hear this, once they know this or begin to understand it, not totally understand, but begin to receive it. It's why they go nuts. Especially if they've been in any other religion. I'm telling you, if I'd heard this 40 years ago, when I was in the midst of the uh, Holiness Pentecostal Church, and I heard that and believed it, whoo, buddy, there'd have been smoke coming off my shoes to get to the first bar, right? Or the first party where there'd be little, you know. Why? Because, hey, no punishment, man. Am I stupid? No, let's go have a good time. But here's the deal. I'm not, I'm not endorsing that. I'm not saying do that. But I'm saying, look what God says. Now, he's dealing with this right off the bat. Because back in the Old Testament, he said, here's the deal. Eat the fat. Drink the wine. Party like it's 1999 is basically what he was saying to these Jews. Because I'm, I'm going to come and save you. And this is going to be the outcome. Whoa. Party. Amen. It's Super Bowl every night. Praise God. You know, and that's, and he's not telling them that so that they would all go out and sin. He's just saying, I know, but here's the deal. You're not being uh, punished or, or uh, beat up on by God because you had a drink of wine or because you ate some pork belly. I mean, come on, these were all, they're Jews. They had rules, but they never had a rule that said you can't drink. See, I'm just saying this. A lot of the things that we say are sin, they're not sin. It's the abuse of those things that become sin. Right? It's not, it, and I'm not, again, I'm not encouraging people to go out and start drinking. I mean, if you don't drink, don't drink. Probably a good idea. But if you do, don't beat yourself up over it. Just don't be a drunk and destroy everybody around you. That's the sin. That, the sin is not the doing. The sin is the impact of the doing. Again, it goes, it goes to this. And that's why he says, here's, the, here's the, the, the only law of the new covenant is you love the Lord your God to the best of your ability. He says with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And obviously we know that's imp impossible for a human. But he's saying the best you can. Love God. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. In this, the whole law and the prophets is fulfilled. So what is he saying? Keep the relationship with me and let that dictate how you relate to people on this level, in the natural. So if, if my, okay, say this, say, I, say I'm drinking. If my, he's not against my drinking until it starts affecting my relationship with her. That's not the drinking he's against, he's against this disturbed relationship that is the result of my drinking too much right and I'm not just talking about drinking it can be anything some people work and they're addicted to their job they never have any time for family they never have time for these relationships they're too busy trying to get rich I mean nothing wrong with being a hard worker I'm just saying he's telling us keep this right and that will help you to keep this right so, so much of the sin that we talk about and make feel, people feel guilty about isn't sin at all. The sin is how we relate to one another, the way we treat each other. We can't be judging each other all the time and think that we're being like God is. Because God is through judging. He did all of his judging on Jesus 2,000 years ago. Which makes possible our relationship with him to heal these relationships this way. Praise the Lord. That's the word of God. That's the word that comes forth, right? 
It's the inspired Word of God. The revelation is what he's talking about. Because anybody can read this. And we know we got all kinds of denominations that have the same Bible. They all got some other rule or some other regulation that this one doesn't have. Why? Well, one thing I learned is because if I, if I convince you that we have some specific rules that we know about, that others don't know about, you better get on board here because they're going to hell. All right? If you're not part of my group, geez, I can't promise you anything. These are the only ones I know because I know what we're saying. I mean, come on. We know, we've been at, right? We've been in those ch churches where they, look, even in the same denomination, they'd have rules. I can tell you, they, we, there were, I don't know how many churches, several different churches that were of the same basic premise and same basic belief system. But each one of them had a little thing different. Why? Because that way I could keep the people I got and they won't go to yours. Because I'll convince them we don't know for sure about yours. We know we're doing it, but we're not sure they're doing it because they've got this little thing they're doing. You know, they actually go bowling. God forbid. But you know what I'm saying. That's, and that's what denominations do. If you're, you're Baptist, you better be a Baptist because we don't know about the Methodists. We're not sure. Well, they seem like good people, but they may not be saved. Right? Catholic, Lutheran, whatever. Just pick one. And they're all just different enough to make you feel like if I'm not in that group, then I'm going to be lost. The spirit of his mouth, amen? The spirit of truth. And the light of his life drives back the darkness. All right, the spirit of his mouth. God is giving us mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation in this last day. That's what I believe, amen? Causing his life to bring us into heavenly places, which is victory. Makes us victorious over every lie of the devil. Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 18, and I'm just about done. And I really mean that. I'm not lying. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18. I'm trying to get to work them up an appetite, Sheila. <laughs> Keep them long enough. They'll be hungry. And therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. So seeing ourselves in Christ is how God is going to reveal himself to the world. Through us. He reconciles us, or makes things right between us and him. And we're supposed to do the same thing for other people. We're not supposed to be out there saying, you jerk, you know, you're drinking too much. Hey, you're doing this. You're fighting. You're doing, you're doing all that. No, we're supposed to do the same thing God did, and that is to love them while they are yet sinners. Christ died for them, right? So we're supposed to show that kind of a love and compassion for them because such were some of us. I mean, we were the same thing, and in some ways we still are. The difference is we've been born again. We've learned some truth that it's not based on my behavior anymore. It's based on his. And if you, young man or woman or old man or old lady, if you do the same thing, you get the same benefit. This isn't about, you know, beating yourself up with religious stuff. It's, it's embracing the love of God and, and experiencing that in a way that you can only experience if you have faith. Amen? We are seated with him in heavenly places. Okay, last two scriptures, and I'm going to sh I'll, I'll wrap this up with this and show you what I'm talking about, hopefully. Zechariah chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Mike, Zechariah 4, verse 6 and 7. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Then he answered and he spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. Who in the world would name their kids Zerubbabel? Yeah. <laughs> but nevertheless, this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? What's the big problem, right? Thou shalt become a plain. Whatever that big deal is you've got going on, he said, I'll take care of it. I can flatten it out. Amen. 
And he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace. Not by your might, not by your power, but by my spirit. Right? You know what the name Zerubbabel means? And I looked this up because I've, I've seen that all over and over. I thought there must, must be something good out of that name because that, what are they going to call you? Zer? Bub? Bell? I mean, you know, nicknames Zerubbabel. Z-man. I don't know. But anyhow, I'm saying Zerubbabel, the definition, the, the, the way that word is defined is of or from confusion. Remember Babel, the Tower of Babel? That's, that word means confusion. It means that's what God did to them. They had all, the one language and he confused their languages, right? It was a Babel, the Tower of Babel. Well, Zerubbabel means, or Zerubbabel means from confusion. All right, from confusion, right? All right, now then look, based on that, look at Haggai, verse, uh, chapter 2, verses 19 through 23. And this actually is the last verse. Haggai uh, 2, 19 through 23. So Zerubbabel, he says, Zerubbabel, I'm going to bring that mountain down. That thing that you're fighting, that thing that you can't overcome. If you trust me, my spirit, not by your power, not by your intellect, not by your ability, but just trust in me. I'll flatten that thing out. I'll take care of the obstacle, right? And you'll say, grace, grace. Praise the Lord. So is the seed yet in the barn? I don't know about you, but I don't have, my bank account isn't completely flush. Praise the Lord. So as yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree hath not brought forth. From this day... Well, I bless you. So now he's saying, okay, I know where you're at. Crops aren't coming up. No money in the bank. Job's not looking great. Relationships kind of screwed up. Some issues, some problems, some things that you were hoping you would see, you know, fruit from, and you're not getting it. He says, colon, from this day, Will I bless you? From there, that's where I'm going to bless you from. In the middle of all that crap that looks like nothing's ever going to work, nothing's ever going to come right, nothing's ever going to be like it should be, that's where I'm going to bless you by grace. Right? Because he says, And again the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the fourth and twentieth day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel. In other words, speak to confusion. Speak to the things that aren't in alignment with this. Amen? Governor of Judah saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the throne of the kingdoms, those that are trying to dominate, amen, and I will destroy the strength of those kingdoms of the heathen, or those unbelievers, amen, and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them, and the horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. You don't have to do a thing. They'll kill each other off. Those things that are causing the issues in your life will destroy themselves. Amen. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, or confusion, my servant, and the, or from confusion, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, saith the Lord, and will make thee as a signet, and I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. What is a signet? That's what, remember the prodigal son, he comes home and he says, get the ring, get the robe, get the shoes. The ring, the signet ring, is the ring of authority that represents the father. Or the one who has all the stuff. And he gives you the ring and you become his agent. And whatever you say, you get. Just as if it was him, the father, that was speaking. When they look at that ring, when they look at the seal, right? This Holy Spirit, we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. And when the enemy sees that seal of the Holy Spirit, he's got to bow a knee. If we understand we have legitimate right to those things. And that's what he's telling us. Forget the confusion. You're, you've come out of confusion. You are in the truth. As he is in the truth. Walk in the truth. And you'll receive the, the promises of God. The inheritance. See, the, church, the problem we have is we're too many of us still in confusion. We've been delivered from confusion by the blood of Jesus. But we have a tendency to let it dominate us. And what, what is the confusion? It's the natural crap in the world that's going on around us that we look at and go, oh my God, well, I, I don't know what I can do about that. I don't know what I can do about it. You're not going to do anything about it. Leave the confusion where it is and trust in God and His righteousness. Amen? Amen? There is no confusion in God. It's settled. The end from the beginning. It's finished. And it's all good. 
if you can believe. Quit letting the devil beat you up and quit beating yourself up and start trusting God and see the things change in your life. Amen? Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. Amen. He say, he's telling us we can have complete victory. Amen. We're no longer servants. We are sons and daughters of God. Praise the Lord in Christ. Praise the Lord. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just hold up a sign and say, like the college kids do, send money. <laughs> you know, send what I need, Dad. I'm a father. Daddy. Need a little help here. It's done. Praise the Lord. Amen. This, let's live. Let's live like it is finished. Let's embrace the love of God and enjoy life. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. You only go through this thing once. This, he wants us to enjoy it. He wants us to enjoy this as much as we'll enjoy eternity. And believe me, you can if you'll trust God. Amen. Act as though these other things are not the dominant things. That it's God that dominates and I believe you'll begin to see the changes in our life. Amen. God bless all of you. Appreciate your patience. I know I've been kind of random and rambling, but uh, there's food downstairs for anybody and everybody that would like to stay. Please do, because we want to get rid of it. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean we want it, somebody to take it. If, you're not, if you can't stay to eat it, go down and get some and take it with you. Father, we ask you to bless the food that's down there and everyone who will partake of it. Use it to the nourishment of our bodies and for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. If you don't want it, take some and give it to somebody else. Maybe you've got a neighbor or somebody else that's, uh, you know, can't cook or has got some issues or whatever. Give it to them. You'll be a blessing. God bless you all. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Go eat. Thank you.